I'll call the meeting to order. This is the February 3rd, 2021 regular meeting of the Board of Selectmen in the town of East Lyme at 7.30. Are there any additional agenda or consent items? I don't think so. I think we got the agenda yeah. right. Uh, the delegations, anyone like to speak to the Board of Selectmen this evening? Yes. Norm, Mr. Peck. I guess you're gonna have to go with the name and address, Norm. Yes, uh, Norm Peck, 32 West Main Street, Niantic. Uh, I'm speaking in behalf of the East Lyme Historical Society tonight, uh, of which I'm president. I uh, appreciate the time. Uh, when we learned uh, that the town of East Lyme had reduced its contribution to our cause to $250 after annual payments of about $2,500 per year um, since the 1960s without any notice and in the middle of a pandemic basically preventing any budget budgeted fundraising. We were quite surprised. We didn't know what to think. Uh, our first thought was that my annual reports of activities to the first selectman had not been received. And I found a comment in the budget that said, I quote, Funding in the amount of 2250 requested to the East Lyme Historical Society to assist in the operation and maintenance of historic properties in town. Not supporting request recommended agency work with historical properties to form one unit for all town historical houses. First selectman reduced to zero, board of selectmen restored to $250, unquote. Uh, so it appears that my letter was received, but maybe not read by everybody. Um, as you'll see, we are more than custodians of property. Uh, before I continue, it needs to be said that combining the three organizations would be harmful to the efforts of all, as there are three different sets of themes, goals, objectives, and philosophies to combine was, would cause a reduction in volunteers through discouragement. It would not work. The other groups would agree with me. A general rule of volunteerism is when all are on the same page with similar goals and full unity, volunteerism flourishes. The other issue is uh, in some cases, as organizations get larger, it becomes le they become less financially efficient. This would be the case with our three organizations when such reduced volunteerism is replaced by hiring out. This assemblage of groups would not be health healthy. Uh, our second thought after learning how much money was presented to Brookside Farm and the Sam Smith House was that, are we being punished for being fairly self-sufficient since 1897? Do they think we do not need the money? Uh, does the Board of Selectmen not remember that most of the land that we have maintained for decades as a pleasant western gateway to the town is owned by the town, not to mention the town-owned house on the corner, another Lee house from the 1800s, on which we have spent many thousands of dollars and many man hours preserving as a mid-20th century home. There was a day when our mission being mainly to preserve the Thomas Lee house a town treasure was much prized by our townspeople as being one of, if not the oldest wood frame house in its original state in Connecticut. The purchase and salvation of this house in 1914 was so significant that President Howard Taft came to the dedication ceremony. We're still puzzled. Uh, we have always felt that what we do is appreciated by townspeople. I know for sure that the many history buffs and Thomas Lee descendants that visit from all over the United States think it's a wonderful place. Today, we consider ourselves the key to East Lyme history. Some of the activities that are part of our routine are respond to numerous inquiries of people wanting ancestral and genealogical information of which we have easy access to and an abundance of. A subcommittee of our organization has for the last 20 plus years been 
meeting at the East Lime Room organizing archives. A tip of the iceberg example, uh, we are in possession of every single Nyanic news publication, along with all the photo neg negatives, which will take years to share, organize, and display. We, we maintain the one-room Little Boston Schoolhouse as it was early in the 1900s. We offer four winter lectures free of charge to the public. We have provided a generation of fifth graders with a day of colonial hands-on experiences at the Lee House grounds. Our grounds have been used for years by East Lyme High School archeological classes, allowing archeological digs around the Lee House. We offer for a break-even charge, a limited family archeological dig moderated by the state archeologist. Free tours of the Lee House, schoolhouse and barn exhibits are provided all year. We have a var various fundraisers throughout the years. Our website, which links students of history to many aspects of our town is impressive, is a, if I might say, as is our monthly e-newsletter. We have published many books on Islam subject matter. We host a group of about 20 Nahantic Indian descendants at the Lee House each year and have gathered volumes of information from them handed down over the generations, yet to be organized and published. We have an ongoing project resulting in many tape recordings of East Lyme old timers talking about life in town years ago. Great stuff. It's been said that when an old person passes on, it's like a library has burned to the ground. Again, we plan to organize these and make them available to all. These are some of the things we do. If you knew this already, then I still wonder, could it be, could it all be about worth? Is that all we're worth? Harry Truman once said, there's nothing new in the world except the history you do not know. As a country today, we appear, we appear to be leaving history behind and erasing it in some ways. The nation's report card or the National Assessment of Educational Progress that measures knowledge of American history shows the following items among others. This recent study indicated 85% of our nation's eighth graders did not even score proficient in American history. Another study found that less than one third of the top 75 colleges and universities ranked by US News and World Report magazines even require a course in US history as a graduation requirement for history majors. A recent survey of 41,000 adults by Woodrow Wilson Foundation found that only four out of 10 Americans could pass the US citizenship test given to new immigrants seeking citizenship. It gets worse. Another study found that fewer than 20% of college students surveyed could accurately identify what the Emancipation Proclamation actually did. And what's more, another survey published in 2015 reported that more than one third of new college graduates could not even place the Civil War within the correct 20 year time frame. Our small group of hardworking board members is striving to do what we can to help this out. We are purely a volunteer organization depending on donated labor from within and outside our membership. So monetary donations go a long way towards helping us with our educational and preservation projects. We believe that everyone makes a mark in the world and that his or her efforts should be noted and remembered somehow. This is what we do. We are in possession of many more historical artifacts and documents than we can possibly share and display at this time. We are in regular receipt of artifacts pertinent to the history of the town. One of our goals is to have access to a space in town for an East Lyme Museum and Research Center so that we may share these items in the future. This is important. The promotion of local history enhances the quality of life in any town that chooses to embrace it. So I ask in behalf of the East Lyme Historical Society, that you reconsider our worth in the upcoming budget discussions. A donation to the organization is money well spent. 
I would encourage all of you to come to the Lee House grounds and receive a personal guided tour of the place. Please help us out and thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Peck. I'm going to let you know that it's already been restored in the budget. Uh, we cut many items of, out of last year's budget because of the COVID. We'll go over that later, and I will have a full response to your, your requests and your statement. Um, I'm looking at almost a dozen different organizations that were cut last year due to um, uh, an increased pressure because of COVID in the economy. Um, and they've all been restored and the selectmen are receiving their budget today. Are there any other comments from the public? Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting, January 20th, 2021. Kevin, you gotta you gotta unmute yourself, Kev. Look at that. Thank you. To Kevin Siri, I move to approve the regular meeting minutes of January 20, 2021 as submitted. Second, Mark Second. Salerno. It's been seconded, Mr. Salerno. Um, any other comments, questions, corrections? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Any abstain? Consent calendar, please. This is Kevin Siri. I move to approve the consent calendar for the meeting of February 3rd, 2021 in the amount of $1,839.61. Second. Second. And Mrs. Hardy seconds it. Uh, any comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Any abstentions? Terrific. The special, we'll go right to new business then, the special appropriation of the fire marshal's respirators um, is, a pr is a pretty good explanation and a lot of, John, <laughs> uh, Mr. Wade is here, lots of backup material that was in your packet that I'm sure you all read through and now you're experts on respirators. But what we're doing is transitioning to these respirators. They're more lightweight. They're more... Um, um, replaceable, if you will, of personnel changes. It, it's, a, it's a quick fix um, rather than the SB, SCBA, I call it scuba uh, gear, uh, the big air tanks that our, our firefighters wear, but our fire marshals um, are typically, uh, they would like to be outfitted into these respirators. We were gonna put into last, next year's budget, the budget you're receiving tonight, we we're gonna put it into 21-22, but there is money um, available in the CNRE Fund 32 to make this purchase now. Uh, I will note that Mr. Way also was able to give, was it, how many scuba, uh, I call it scuba, if you, so forgive me, but the self-contained breathing apparatus, you had a couple in your department, John. How many, was there two or, or four? And now you're muted too. Everybody's muted. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry about that. There were four. There were four. So each fire department was able to benefit from the uh, donations from your department so they could reduce their requests in the future uh, for the self-contained breathing apparatus. John, do you want to give us, um, you know, a 30 second uh, uh, over the top synopsis of what you're asking for here? Well, it basically, as, um, as you stated, um, the, uh, the, the newer units are more lightweight. Um, typical fire investigation could go uh, one, two, three, maybe four hours. Um, the units are uh, lightweight, more efficient. Uh, if we change personnel, um, it's just a matter of changing out a mask, which is approximately a, a, around $100. Um, the filter cartridges last um, an extremely long time. We're actually modeling it after the um, Connecticut um, State Fire and Explosion Unit. Um, they, they do fire investigations every day, and they've switched to these units and are very happy with them, not only with the cost, but the efficiency of wearing them. Uh, they're not cumbersome, allow you free movement. Um, the air packs that you would wear normally, like the fire department, you know, would wear up to upwards of 30 pounds. And then the cylinders are only good time would be for approximately 20 minutes. So we'd have to change the cylinders out. And then really we'd have to find a, a, a source to refill the bottles. And then annual maintenance on an air pack 
um, you're looking at, at about $100 a year to uh, have the, the pack flow tested and then pressure testing of the cylinder every three years. So it's, it's a much more cost-effective um, unit, I believe, and uh, more user-friendly. Are there any questions for our fire marshal? I just want to say, uh, going through that, John, that's very thorough, and you, you amply describe w what the need for that is. So if you like, I'll get a motion out there, and then we can discuss it. This is Kevin Surrey. I'll move to approve a special appropriation and transfer in the amount of $2,412 in CNRE Fund 32 from account number 32-70-300-500-999 Townwide Projects to an account to be established titled PS-F Marshall Respiratory Protection Equipment and forward to the Board of Finance for approval. I'll second it. Motion and seconded. As, are there any other questions or comments? Glad we could do this uh, at this time through CNRE, so money we've already put aside for other projects that was left over. So this is a, a good a use of this, these funds. Thank you, uh, John, for your attendance tonight on this item. All in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Any abstentions? The next item on our agenda is, um, is uh, also deals with the fire marshal's department and uh, through no fault of John's, uh, not not fault. We have a very big, cumbersome, detailed budget. And when, as we've been splitting up the duties of fire marshal and emergency management, and you remember there was one big old budget um, that encompassed everything. We've been splitting that up. And of course, we hired a new fire marshal at the beginning of the uh, year. And um, we just neglected to give him his COLA increase, which he'd be entitled to as he has completed um, a year. So um, the, the COLA sits out there. We need to take some money from the contingency to cover the 2.25% increase, which is part of um, his agreement with the town. This is Kevin Siri. I'll move to appropriate and transfer $1,912.50 from account number 01-01-120-200-500 contingency to account number 01-25-224-100-211 fire marshal for the 2020-2021 cost of living increase and forward to the Board of Finance for approval. Mark Salerno second. Mr. Salerno seconds that. Thank you, Mr. Siri, for the motion. Any further comments? Keep up the good work, John. Uh, really trust that you have uh, a good handle on things over there. Oh, All and I just want to say thank you to, to Anna also for working with me on this. Uh, a, a lot of the budget stuff, I mean, I, I know how to do the inspections and the investigations, but the money part of it, Anna, has been uh, very invaluable. So I really appreciate your help. There is a system involved, right? You got to know the system. <laughs> and right. Anna, it's been very good at bringing people along. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Are aye. there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Of course not. So thank you very much. Uh, for that and uh, continued success over there, Mr. Way. Uh, the next on our agenda is to see the corridor study. Folks, let me bring you back to um, uh, maybe a couple years ago when East Lyme was awarded through the Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments um, selection for a corridor study. Uh, I've been told I say that wrong. Corridor, um, a, a corridor study. Um, I'm, I overemphasize my R because I'm from Boston, and I want to say CORDA, CORDA study. Um, and we have a mat, an obligation for a matching 10%. Now, a CORDA study um, it happens on a state road, and this is the first thing that happens for the state to put a particular roadway in its focus for improvements. Now, Flanders Road, 161, going across Gordon Pond, but really starting at the highway and going all the way to Main Street, encompasses this study. The focus will be from where the Flanders Road, and, and Mr. Mingo's still here, he talks about this often, where Flanders Road goes from 
two lanes going um, south to one lane right in front of Iliano's, the old Vinny's Pizza Haven. Uh, and it all merges very quickly and it takes that one road. And of course it goes around Gordon Pond. The, the, on, the, on the wish list for the town for many years has been to extend sidewalks down that roadway and even a bike lane down that, down that roadway, especially around that tight turn where that, that house sticks out and the road kind of kicks inward. Um, we've had many fatalities, uh, uh, traffic accidents and fatalities at that site. And it's certainly not a place that any one of us would recommend to anyone in our town, especially our sons and daughters, to walk along that road. There is no room for a sidewalk. There's no room along the edge of the road as Gordon Pond and the, and, the, and the guardrail is right there. So we were very successful and very, I'm very happy about this, that we can get this done, that the state is going to come down and do a study. And because that it will benefit the town, of course, there is a 10% buy-in. There's also, um, um, you know, a personnel buy-in, if you will. Mr. Gaishel has been working with um, the Council of Governments, uh, Kate Rattan, um, putting the grant money together, or the, study, uh, the study paperwork together, and will certainly be involved with the implementation of the study and the eventual improvement to this road. I'll pause there, and since Mr. Gaishel has joined our meeting tonight, I'll ask him if he'd like to add anything to that. Certainly. Uh, just for a quick clarification, um, to let you know that the, the board had already, uh, earlier day closer, it was about 2018, had uh, agreed to commit to $20,000, which was a 10% match. Uh, the application that was submitted to DOT was for $250,000, and surprisingly, uh, it was approved. So um, our feelings were to leverage the entire $250,000. we would have to come back to the board uh, and request um, that they increase the match to $25,000. Uh, that said, uh, Kate Rutan from the Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments felt that being that the corridor was fairly extensive and fairly long, um, our application did include areas north of 95 as, as far as the high school. Um, so we'll also be looking at those areas from the high school to 95. Most of the area from in, in the vicinity of 95 has been looked at by the uh, State Traffic Commission um, as a result of the Costco and the, the Gateway development. But those areas south of that, as Mark already explained, certainly need, need a closer look. Um, so that said, uh, I would respectfully request the board increase the match amount so we can fully leverage the $250,000 uh, to implement the study and, and get that ball rolling. Thank you for reminding me to bring that up. That we, we've already talked about this and we, we did approve 20,000. Our request is now to move it to 25 as we're getting a bigger study uh, for the buck. Um, so uh, that would be the request tonight. Okay, this is Kevin Sorry, uh, I'll put that motion out. I'll move to support a commitment of funds letter in the amount of $25,000 and authorize the first selectman to sign a letter for the Route 161 corridor study grant made available by federal program funds through Connecticut DOT to be administered by um, Southern Connecticut Council of Government. The source of the funds to be appropriated once the final award is granted are in CNRE Fund 32, account 32-70-300-500-999, townwide projects, and forward to the Board of Finance for approval. Second, Mr. Daigle. Um, I heard Mr. Daigle um, is a second. Uh, are there any questions or further comments? Yes, I think. I'd like to. Uh, All right, I'll wait. All right, Roseanne. Well, you have the option to go first or second. You're the uh, senior person, so. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I'll go then. Go ahead, Roseanne. Uh, so in the recent in the recent POCD study, um, one of the big things that came out of that was request for more hiking paths, walking paths, bicycling. And uh, we have long wanted to try to do something around Gordon Pond. I think in a previous study, there were some drawings that were done that suggested maybe cantilevering um, a sidewalk to go out over the lake a little bit in order to get that to fit in there. Um, so I think this is something that, would, that has some public support. 
And if we've we, we've already approved the the twenty thousand, and if we're short of the grant, it seems worthwhile to just extend it to the extra five thousand. But um, my recollection is that this does not involve any uh, lane widening or any eminent domain taking of private property. Am I correct in that recollection? I don't think that that's uh, off the table, those items. I, th I think when you're talking about adding bike lanes and sidewalks, I think there will be a widening of the road and quite possibly eminent domain based on the topography and the layout of the road. Well, will this study, uh, once the study is done, I assume it comes back to us for final approval? Uh, well, it's a state to state road and ultimately it's their approval, but we'll, we'll work with them as partners in this uh, to come up with the best solution. Okay, thank you. Okay, what Roseanne said. I, pretty much what I was gonna say, so I won't add to that. Okay. Yeah, Just the only thing I'll add is I think everyone's in agreement that there is significant opportunity to include the safety of that road, not only for the pedestrians, uh, if sidewalks or bike paths are added, but just for the drivers. And um, the study should identify more than one option. And uh, as the study is ongoing and before it's concluded, I would uh, expect that the town would have a voice in which uh, which one of the options we favored. So like, we said, like you said, Mark, we don't approve it, the final plan, but we certainly uh, should have a voice at the table. And we do. And we do. Was there anyone else? Mr. Salerno? Yeah. Um, so a couple things. Um, I assume, so you mentioned it's going to be the sidewalk and a possible, by recollection, possible realignment down near the pond, which is that term, right? I would think, I think it's, you're alluding to that there may not be enough land there. Um, I'm totally in favor of it. Um, I think we need to connect our sidewalks. Uh, as a kid, I used to run my bike past Scorton Pond and I drive by there now and cringe at the thought. Um, it's very dangerous. So. Um, it's about time. Mark, do you know um, who, who hires the contractor to do this? Is it the state? Do, are, do they making the choice of the contractor? Uh, Gary, that? That, Gary, help me out with that. Yeah, I, I believe that the uh, Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments will, will do that uh, as we are partnering with them in the grant. So we'll be administering that grant. Uh, we'll choose the contractor in concert with them. Okay, so we have a say in that part. Yes. Okay. Uh, when when do you, uh, Gary, anticipate this will be started? And is there an end date that uh, we're aiming for? Uh, at this point, uh, I guess as a result of COVID, for lack of uh, any better excuse, um, yeah. we're about a year behind. So we'll just kick everything out one year. So most likely uh, we'll finish up the end of next year about this time in 2022. We should have a final study, I would, I would think. Um, We'll have to, I'll, talk, I'll work with Kate. I'll be happy to report back to Mark or the board uh, as to a, a more definitive timeline as we solidify that. Great. Thank you, Gary. You're That's welcome. a good idea. We'll, we'll, we'll keep on informing the Board of Selectmen on the progress and when a, uh, when a vendor has been selected uh, to do the study and, um, and we'll engage at that point. Any other questions? I would just say I echo uh, the other uh, comments. Um, I, I, I support it. Uh, it's certainly consistent with the, our plan of conservation development, I would think. And um, uh, that road really does need some attention. It's a, it's a very dangerous situation. I did have occasion to walk down that road about a year ago uh, near the lake. And uh, I was shocked at how little clearance there is between the guardrails and the cars. So I think that'd be a wonderful thing if we could help uh, maybe have a, a way to extend the sidewalks uh, past that area. So Indeed. Indeed. full support of it. Yeah. And we might have to connect the dots too. There might be, you know, uh, down the line as the state goes, okay, we're going to, we're going to improve this much. We may want to go and include some sidewalks to extend it to existing sidewalks, et cetera. But the bottom line is between what's gone on with Costco, the eventual highway, um, rebuild 
including off ramps that will go through where Star Starlight is now and the mobile station and all that. And that's all sidewalked up. And, and so really we're, I mean, I'm focused and we're, we're, where my energy went in, in, secu in securing this study um, in Gary's as well um, was that Gordon Pond area because we've talked about it for way too long in this town. And yes, um, Mrs. Hardy brought up the fact that we, we were talking about, I think she used, you said the word uh, cantilever. We were even talking a boardwalk that went out almost over Gordon Pond and then came back so we could preserve the trees there um, and the nature, but to somehow create a pedestrian slash bike path that got off the road. Uh, bottom line is we're going to have an improved road there. That is one of the main arteries of uh, access to um, uh, egress as well to, to uh, Niantic and also connects our villages. So uh, um, I think we have a motion. Did we, I think we have to go for a uh, vote, right? Uh, so all in favor of the motion to um, fund the study of $25,000, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, great. Thank you all for, uh, and thank you, Gary, for coming on, board, coming on board tonight. Appreciate that. Um, next on our agenda are, are two items of appointments, and I don't know that we're ready to, act on this yet i did receive one application from a citizen um interested um in um uh, the police commission and i know there were some other people in our community interested i didn't get anything formal yet i think we probably need to lock that down and work with both political parties and maybe even put something on our website and i think being a police commission and being in this day and age that we probably want to go through a little bit of an interview process. Um, maybe get to know who these people are and who we're putting on the police commission. It's a, it's, a, it's a different commission than it was just two or three years ago when we formed it. Um, not for um, any other reason that the world is, is changing. There's a lot more focus on policing issues, et cetera. So we want to put the right person on the police commission to uh, fill, uh, finish out the term of um, our, um, Lisa Pellegrino that uh, resigned. So I would encourage the selectmen to go ahead and, and, and again, try to find some members and maybe at our next meeting, we can spend a chunk of time talking to some people who might be interested in becoming members. And please give me a call uh, during the week um, if you know of anybody who'd be interested. Appreciate that. And also on our agenda, planning commission is listed. Um, I knew they had a, um, um, a vacancy, but it slipped my mind that they have their own ability to uh, appoint that. Um, and I think that um, vacancy is just starting. So they have another 30 days before they uh, um, run out of time to fill that vacancy. So we'll let the, the good people of the Planning Commission, aided by our, our good uh, uh, leader in, in, in Gary Gayshell, you'll, you'll get your, your Planning Commission to figure that, all that out. And if you need any help with names and all that, Gary, by all means, reach out. Will do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, scheduled budget meetings is next on the agenda. You all, do you all receive your budget today? The big yes. budget books were delivered. In that, I wrote a letter as I do at, at the beginning of every budget season. It takes me a whole year to write this, a whole year. So don't, don't just flip past it. I want you to read it. Um, I will highlight just a couple items, and those are the pressure points of this budget. I'm very proud of the budget. Ann and I worked very hard on it. Um, there's some issues going on with, you know, town government that I want to talk about. And one of them is the police accountability law. Um, as you know, there's a new law in Connecticut, and that is going to put pressure on the need to increase our training, testing, um, background checks, equipment like body cameras. Um, and also there's an accreditation process, a three-year accreditation process that's going to require lawyers, um, 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 an expert in the field of accreditation of police forces, and many man hours from our own department. That's one issue. Um, another issue is there was a study done in the state of Connecticut 
um, of the number of police officers per thousand people in a town. Um, you know, um, and, and East Lyme ranked fourth from the bottom of that list. We are, we've been talking about how woefully undermanned, understaffed we are um, as a police force. And we, um, and our police commission is taking on the uh, responsibility of gathering up some information. And when we meet with our police um, chief and the police commission, they will have a presentation about the need for more police in our town. Um, again, I think this is a town that values safety, safe neighborhoods, um, and our responsibility, our liability in our responsibility as, a, as town leaders. Um, and and as appearing on a list fourth from the bottom of, of police officers per thousand is not really uh, indicative of how we value public safety. Another issue is build, the building department. We have seen a record number in this past year, even with COVID, a record number of building permits. Um, and um, we're not keeping up with them. Um, we have a statutory obligation to push a building permit through uh, the system in 30 days. And very often we run up right up against that deadline. We need more personnel and we need more administration uh, in that department. And of course that department has a revenue source that pays for it. We're not supposed to use the revenue source of the building department and pay for other things in town. We're supposed to collect the fees that pay for the building department and spend it in the building department. And uh, there is plenty of room there as we are collecting fees, but we do not have uh, proper personnel to attend to all those um, the permits that are coming in and continue to come in. I'll jump down one. Uh, Inland Wetlands is, a current, is also um, going to have some pressure in that the Inland Wetlands Commission passed a new regulation that um, all, all building permits, all development within 300 feet, not 100 feet of an upland review area will need to now put in a permit, pay a fee and be reviewed, sometimes by the commission, often by the, um, by the department head, but that's gonna create an abundance of work down there. And we don't really have room in our man hour schedule to accept hundreds of more fees, uh, hundreds of more applications in the course of a year. So we put in for $25,000 for, uh, for added hours that will come from someone who works at the COG, which is our regional planning um, department if you will. And they, uh, from some of the smaller towns, they provide the planning, the wetlands officers, sometimes zoning um, to uh, the smaller towns. And I've asked the Council of Governments to consider what the cost would be if we added a few extra hours uh, in the course of uh, um, every week. And uh, we budgeted $25,000 because of the added increase in inland wetlands. I'll move up again to, uh, on my sheet. Uh, the information technology that we talked about so much last year is improving. And we, while we haven't gone out and hired an IT director yet, we are consolidating all the departments to one IT platform, if you will. And, um, and, and with the help of Joe Braga, who's kind of spearheaded this project and Star Computers, we have a better handle on our IT, IT issues than we ever have before. I, uh, Star Computers has held their rates down artificially low. You know, they're a local vendor and um, they've been our vendor for quite a while, but they do need uh, to increase their fees to keep up with the going rate and most of the cost increases in IT a result of those issues. We will talk a lot about budget. Um, do read my letter. It will just bring you up to speed on where we are with the, the COVID situation, with the economy, um, with state aid, um, et cetera. The budget um, that you received, if you flip to the front page, you'll see that we're just a fraction over a 4% increase for the town side. The total town side is 3.08 when you include the debt and the principal and the capital. Uh, and the Board of Ed currently sits at 4.05%. We need to put together a schedule 
for budget reviews. Um, you may want to see a lot of these budgets. I, I, I don't know. Generally, we bring the big ones in um, and we can go with last year's schedule. And then if anyone has any other interests of bring people in, be happy to do that. What, um, what would you suggest? Uh, usually we meet an hour or two before a regular meeting and then we add a couple more um, meetings in our schedule. Uh, our next meeting is in two weeks. I believe that's the 17th but we probably should get busier sooner than that. Thoughts? I'm good with you know, I, I, the schedule that you gave us uh, preliminary. I think that works pretty good for me. Uh, I, I checked that against my calendar. I don't have any uh, concerns with it. Do I have the schedule? We know. have the list of dates. We have the yeah. list of dates. It's uh, in your board of selectmen book. Okay. Okay. Uh, I didn't. Get, I uh, haven't picked up my book. My book yet. Uh, is are the specific departments listed by date that we're going to interview? Not yet. No, one. The, the list okay. I have, Roseanne, is uh, Monday the eighth. You know, right. Wednesday the seventeenth. I have that. But yes, I, I have that listing, but I don't have the specific budget. So I think if we start with February 8th and uh, just decide on one or two of the bigger budgets that we can review over the weekend, uh, then I'm okay with starting with the 8th, just so long as we know which, which ones we're doing. Also, uh, this year, especially having to do everything by Zoom, uh, I wonder if the smaller budgets where there are no changes, if it's necessary for us to, uh, aside from reviewing them ourselves, is it necessary for us to call those, call those uh, department heads or commission leaders in for reviews? I if, think it's I was, a, if it's an as-is budget? In the last couple of years, we have not. Yeah. Uh, I think that's... Oh, sorry, Mark. When, when I was just going to say that. Well, when there's a lot of moving pieces, we definitely want to. And the budgets I just mentioned, IT and and uh, in the wetlands because of the issues they're having there, and maybe the maybe the building department. You might want to talk to these people, these department heads, and and hear firsthand uh, the pressures that they're under. But you're right, uh, Roseanne. We're talking to a lot of budgets that are are flat. You know, the clerk's office, the, the assessor's office, zoning, um, um, so many budgets that would remain flat. So uh, I can work up a schedule. Um, I think there's too many dates here. Yes. Um, I don't think you're going to need Thursday the 25th and even Tuesday the 2nd could be an optional day um, if needed, I suppose. But I think we could go That's through like the budget and um, relieve, relieve a... Uh, release a schedule of the budgets. Yes, Anna? So um, when Sandy, um, everyone, the schedule of meetings, she was good enough to attach last year's agendas um, that of the meetings that we had. So I went through all of those agendas and looked at the list of all the departments. And for the most part, all of the departments listed on those meetings are the larger departments and the ones remaining are all the smaller ones as you're pointing out. So um, I think that would give everyone an idea that you would really need four meetings because it looks, it, you know, there were three meetings to deal with uh, town departments and then the fourth meeting was for a board of education budget presentation. Right. Terrific. Yeah, and the one here would, you know, maybe for Monday, if it would give them time, uh, is there any major changes in the library? I haven't looked at the budget book yet. Is there any, because it, it has parks and rec, public works, which public works, engineering, building maintenance, et cetera, pretty much comes along with that. Right. But it has library, market has first selectment and general government miscellaneous and benefits. Right. Uh, do we need, I didn't see, is there a big change with library that we need to go through? No, it's actually, I think, is there budget, uh, Anna, Anna, we went back and forth on this. Are they, are they actually going down or are they flat? 
Yes, yeah, so the, the, the library is actually, there's actually a decrease in the library budget. However, that's due to the fact that in this year's budget, they're not going to spend everything that we provided to them in their subsidy. So they're going to carry it forward to next year. So it's because of that carry forward that their budget is actually going, you know, going down in next year's budget. Right. How about, how about if for next Monday we have, this, if, if Mark, if this works for us, uh, Parks and Rec, Public Works, Engineering, Building Maintenance, First Selectman, and General Government Miscellaneous and Benefits. And then at that meeting, we can decide who we want to see next because we'd have basically, a, you know, almost a week and a half to come up with uh, who we'd want to see on the 17th. Good with that. Why don't we keep the, I mean, does, any, does anybody want to speak to the library? I, they have a flat budget. Um, no, I, I, I said, I, I, yeah. I omitted that one. I know you did. Does, oh. it, does anyone have a burning desire to talk to the library? No, but can I, can I make a suggestion that um, anyone, any stakeholder that wants to come to us, yeah. you, you know, we, we can select, but just like we heard some stuff today that maybe there was a miscommunication especially anyone that's getting a, a change from what they requested. Um, I think we should at least offer if they want to, if they can. Um, otherwise than that, the Board of Selectmen will be reaching out to, to boards and commissions or, or whoever, stakeholders, <laughs> requesting um, having them before us. We'll put that message out there as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll meet on Monday the 8th. Mark. The 8th. Yeah. Ms. Paul, I, I have two other town meetings on that, one Board of Ed and one in the wetland, so I assume that our meeting will take precedence on the 8th for me. Yes, uh, always. Thank you. Uh, yes. You don't seem upset to hear that, Paul. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you. Mr. Gaisel, I think, is come is probably going to go to the inland wetlands, and he'll, he'll bring you up to speed if he needs to. Thank you. Or, you know, you can put them in one ear and you can put me in the other. <laughs> that doesn't work good when you forget to mute yourself. <laughs> so very good we'll meet on monday at 6 p.m and we'll inform those those budgets um to be uh ready um so you want to list them off again kevin for yeah uh, some studying right uh parks and rec public works you know highway and sanitation and 105 engineering 113 building maintenance 101 first selectman and 114 general government miscellaneous and benefits. So it's really Dave Putnam, Joe Braga, Nickerson. I mean, my first selectman budget is, is flat, if, if anything. Uh, there's really nothing there. Um, and uh, Anna, it, we'll right. talk to the general government. Um, we can talk to the services that night too, community services, which is what Norm Peck was speaking to earlier this evening, um, that we cut many organizations back last year as we were um, trying to, trying to bring in a flat budget as, as flat as possible because of the economic <laughs> crisis. So um, we will hey, speak to that as well in, in great detail. Do we want to have, uh, I, if we're going to have Joe McGraw come in, do we want to have IT come in as well to save him a trip? Um, the, I, um, the IT was bundled with all of the public safety departments. Yeah. I think I think that's going to be on another night with with uh, police, fire, ambulance. Um, not that we have an ambulance budget, but they come in because they're part of it. I think we're going to put IT there, and we'll probably do fire marshal that night too. So. And I did speak with Joe Bergaud today um, because you know let, letting him know that based on the information that Sandy had provided, that he may be up on um, February eighth for his. Um, you know, most of his budgets and then a separate meeting for IT with all the safety departments. And he, he understood that. He just said, let's do IT first on that night. And um, so okay. that would be, you know, the only thing he would look for. Right. I guess we have a schedule then and um, we'll see you on Monday at six o'clock for budget meetings and it will start. Um, I don't see any communication. So ex officio reports, um, Mr. Salerno. I don't have anything to report. Mr. Siri. Nope, nothing. Mr. Cunningham. My meeting was canceled, uh, so I have nothing. Uh, Mrs. Hardy. I'd like to thank the other members of the Board of Selectmen for yielding their time to me. No. 
<laughs> so, Commission on Aging. Uh, certainly with the pandemic, uh, we have uh, concerns about the elderly population in town. And uh, so I think uh, you'd find it interesting that on any given day, there are 25 to 35 meals delivered to individual homes. And these are meals for uh, noontime and evening. They come frozen and you can uh, keep them as needed. Uh, there were some concerns expressed about um, when we when we have inclement weather, then of course we don't expect the volunteers to go out and deliver food. But uh, there are three or four boxes of prepackaged meals that are de delivered um, well before the emergency. These are emergency boxes. They have uh, things in them that uh, don't need to be cooked, don't require electricity, crackers, peanut butter, et cetera. And there'd be, there'd be enough in there for two or three meals. So um, I think that that uh, uh, says a lot for the commission for pre-planning and to make sure that our seniors are well taken care of. Uh, two to three volunteers every day using their own vehicles go out and deliver to these homes. And so consequently, again, as we had bad weather Monday and Tuesday, meals were, frozen meals were not delivered, but everyone who was on the list already had in their possession um, at least uh, two boxes of meals, as I described previously. Um, so there's a cadre of 10 volunteers, uh, and then they rotate so they don't go out every day, uh, the same people. And uh, I think it's a very important program because for many of the people who are homebound and more aged than I, hard to believe, uh, that uh, it gives them a contact. The doorbell is rung uh, to indicate that uh, somebody's on. It's, it's usually between 11 and 11:30, so the people know that that would be the, the that would be the uh, person who would be delivering the meals. Uh, if there's no answer, then um, a knock on the door, and if there still is no answer after a short period of time, then the volunteer would step into the house, announce themselves and to make certain that there wasn't uh, a problem, that the person was non-responsive in some way. So again, a very valuable service for our elderly population. Uh, we had on a previous request, a vehicle, a request for the new vehicle, which was uh, partially funded, mostly funded by a grant from the state. That vehicle has not yet been delivered, but the other vehicles are holding up well and uh, there's there's no problem there with the delay. I'm not quite sure why delivery has not arrived yet. Uh, it could be uh, any number of things. So uh, I would also like to give a shout out to Lillian's Restaurant, who uh, at Christmas time provided 500 meals, free of charge, available to any in the elderly community. And if uh, someone was homebound and could not get out, then um, through working through Commission on Aging, uh, those meals could be picked up in the name of somebody else and brought to them. And I think it's a, that's an excellent example of why East Lyme is a great place to live. 500 meals donated in a time of a crisis when restaurants are suffering and losing money to donate that and uh, to have all of their employees assist in preparing the meals and getting them ready, all you had to do was drive up, if able, drive up, pick up the meal. Somebody, uh, they were bagged. And um, what a wonderful Christmas gift for uh, people in our community in that age group. So shout out to the Commission on Aging and especially Lillian. They also have a very ambitious program schedule lined up for the spring. And of course, most of those are going to be uh, the majority of them, as we now know, will uh, only go forward if they're able to be presented through uh, Zoom. And uh, I haven't checked with Ms. Wilson, uh, but um, something that we might want to look into 
uh, as a commission is the number of people who might benefit from those programs but don't have the ability to use Zoom. And I think that um, that will be something that the commission will be discussing. Uh, zoning has public hearing tomorrow night, and that uh, involves a permit, which requires a special permit for mixed use uh, development proposed for 159 Boston Post Road. And if you don't know your house numbers, that would be the property that's uh, just up from the fire department. Um, and it's, it, over the years, it's had uh, several iterations, but most recently a nail salon. It's a single standing White House. Um, you've probably all driven by it numerous times, right near East Line Pizza. And um, it, is, it requires a special permit for mixed use public hearing first, and then that uh, following the public hearing, that will be discussed as part of the regular zoning agenda. And I think I've exhausted my time. And everybody else? That's it. As, as you uh, warned us, we're going to use everybody else's time. Roseanne, nice to hear yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you for your good work. Yeah, that's that white building. It's right next to the Flanders School, too. So it's a building between Flanders School and, uh, and the pizza uh, place, uh, Eastside Pizza. Um, yeah, the old uh, parsonage there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, Mr. Mr. Daigle. Uh, the only uh, meeting I had since our last meeting was the uh, building committee. Um, I'll give you an update on the public safety building. The work is proceeding uh, ahead of schedule. The contract is doing very well. Um, there's been several uh, change orders put in. Um, so far, um, of the 301,000 contingency budget, about 88,000 uh, of that um, contingency has been used. 33,000 was, was before the building committee started with the elect additional work that the architectural firm had to do through our multiple uh, step approval process. Uh, and I briefed you on the changes that were approved um, at our last meeting regarding the sheetrock walls and some new ceilings that need to be done. Uh, this, the outstanding changes uh, bring you from the 88 up to 113. And uh, the biggest ticket item there is builder's risk insurance, which uh, Anna brought to the attention of the building committee. Uh, as being uh, something that's required. Uh, so they should be voting on that uh, at their meeting this month. Uh, and there's also two credit uh, change orders. One to eliminate uh, some stone, fill stone for 2,900 and one to uh, $5,200 to um, reduce the grade of the VCT flooring in the evidence area. Those are not yet approved, but they'll be covering them at this month's meeting. And uh, the design work for the move of the fire marshal's office to the second floor is proceeding. Uh, not exactly sure when it'll be done, but then they'll get a cost estimate for that. So basically, if everything that's on the table is approved, um, there still remains $187,000 in the contingency. Pending any questions, uh, uh, that's all I had to report tonight. Any questions? Thank you for your hard work on that. Um, exciting, uh, you know, that, uh, that that project is moving along um, so efficiently. Um, I don't have much to report. Um, I did sit in on a, um, um, on a Zoom call with Service Across America, Service, Serving America Movement, SAM. And they're, uh, they're all about um, election reforms, um, including ranking elections, which means you would, if there were several candidates, you would rank them in order. And if you know, someone has to get 50% or more to, to move on uh, to be elected, kind of like what we saw in Georgia in the Senate race, uh, that calls for, um, uh, and this is a national movement, uh, but many first elected mayors Republican and Democrats were, were jumping, uh, were, were on this call. Um, so so it, it, 
It was kind of an elections call for less nastiness, less uh, finger pointing to your opponent, and more about what you're bringing to the table. There's also a discussion about term limits and all that. Set in on that, it was very interesting, and I, I might get more involved on that. Um, I, um, I, I, I'm, I was, I'm sorry that, that uh, Mr. Peck isn't with us um, here because I have some answers for him. We cut back um, across the town, it's deep into some budgets, but specifically to services to the community, the Dago Foundation budget, um, the the um, Cultural Coalition, the Eastline Beautification Commission, the veterans, Eastline veterans got cut, um, and the Main Street program got cut. Um, in, in, in all of those cases, knowing that COVID was going to eat away at most of the year, we didn't, we didn't think we'd be sitting out here on February 3rd still talking about it, still shut down, but we did know that there would be significant cuts into Main Street activities and beautification issues and uh, and some organizations we just asked to you know to, to take a step back for a year. We did communicate that out to his organization. Um, he's uh, not the only one on the organization. Uh, I don't know who I reached out to, but let them know that you know based on their and they have a significant endowment. They have a significant bank account. Uh, we don't value any of these organizations any less because we didn't have the money to give them money um, that particular year um, or season. But um, we ha you will notice in your budget, we've restored all of them this year and even added one. I, um, our promise to most of these organizations, including this historical society, is it would be a cut for one year and we would bring it back. Uh, and we're doing just that and making good on our promises. Um, if there's any volunteers of those organizations who say we'll take another cut, by all means, uh, um, we'll consider that. But that's the that's the case there. This budget is tough. Every budget is. This is my seventh budget. Um, we'll we'll spend some time talking about it and some details. Please look it over over the weekend, um, and um, you'll 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 be fascinated by some of the uh, um, great work of our department heads uh, doing everything they can to find efficiencies and, and making do um, um, with what they have instead of asking for more. It, it goes across the town that way. And um, um, I'm awfully proud uh, to work alongside of these, these men and women. Uh, they are true professionals. That's my report for this evening. Uh, there, is there any public comment? If not, uh, Diane Vitagliano, do you know who she is? She's our town assessor. And she was on the call, and I think she was here for a hot minute, and then off she went. And she probably thought she missed her opportunity to speak. I would have let her speak. Um, she just finished the grand list, and we're seeing the best increase in grand list that we've seen in almost almost two decades, uh, de at least a dozen and a half years. Um, so um, she will report to you. I might even ask her to come and start our meeting on Monday um, because you want to hear about the revenue side of our budget, not just the expense side. And the grand list is up 2.1%, I believe, which is a significant increase. That's a you know, full Costco. That's the apartments on the hill. That's the storage unit, guys oil. So much building, so much improvement, so much investing in our town that, um, that we're seeing the benefits now on the bottom line. So um, that will take some pressure off of our budget. So... Um, We'll have to, we'll, we'll speak to that as well, and Anna and Diane can give us an idea of what that means when we're talking about mill rate increases and in budgets. If we also have increased revenues coming from an increased grand list, what does that do to our expenses? We don't want to spend just because we can. We're going to look at every line in our budget and make sure we're getting the most efficiency out of our budget, um, but but it also will help to know that the, the, the tax increase won't be as significant because there's significant grand list growth. 
that's great news. So I'll bring her in either on, on Monday if she can make it or at a following budget meeting. Um, that's all I have. Um, Kevin Terry, I'll move to adjourn. Mark Salerno, second. Second. Great. Hey, hey, um, go Tom Brady. Oh, yes. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Um, thank you all. I'll see you Monday night.